Hello everyone. Welcome once again to Overselling Parts Unknown. I am Bro with Glasses here for another discussion video. This one is going to be a bit longer than my usual one. So grab a snack, sit down and open your ears up as I spit this game to you. And today we are going to discuss five superstars who I see realistically making the jump from AEW to WWE. Now, of course, I have to preface, <laughs> preface this video by saying I don't have inside sources, okay? I, I don't know any of these talents I'm about to mention personally. This is all my opinion. These are ideas and thoughts I have formulated from watching television and seeing where these people stand within the company and how they are being booked on television. So again, take what you hear in this video with a very tiny microscopic grain of salt. And I know you will get the people who might mention, well, this wrestler said they're AEW for life. This is my home, et cetera, et cetera. All right, that's fine if you want to believe that. But Cody Rhodes said the exact same thing and look where he is now. So let's just have fun with this and let's get right to it. All right. Number one, in no particular order, as you probably know, if you saw the thumbnail, Ethan Page is the first superstar that I think could possibly make the jump to WWE. Ethan Page uh, made his debut at AEW Revolution 2021 as a surprise entrant in the face of the Revolution ladder match. His contract had, had expired in Impact Wrestling where he left his partner, uh, Josh Alexander, who I think is doing better <laughs> of the two as he is the Impact World Champion. Anyway, uh, Ethan Page, after not winning that ladder match, he would pretty much do nothing of relevance for his entire run. He would go on to have AEW's first coffin match against Darby Allin. And after that, he was put into a faction with Dan Lambert, who, who needs to forever stay off of television. That guy is extremely annoying. Scorpio Sky and a bunch of random UFC dudes. So they could feud with Jericho and the Inner Circle, which was a super lame feud, by the way. After that, Scorpio Sky and Ethan Page were put together as a tag team of sorts, even though Scorpio Sky was the one getting the main focus uh, with his TNT title run, which, funny enough, he won that opportunity in that ladder match that Ethan Page made his, made his debut in. Funny how that works but as of right now um they are no longer together after scorpio sky has disappeared after you know losing the belt to wardlow last month and they are running this angle of sorts where ethan page is shooting brother and he's upset at not getting the opportunities that everyone else has and it looks like they're putting him in this new faction that Stokely Hathaway is creating. And so far, it, it looks like Ethan Page, The Gun Club, and Lee Moriarty. That sounds whack. <laughs> I'm sorry. That, that sounds like one of the worst factions I've ever heard of. Now, Ethan Page is a guy that I look at. And I put him in the same category as uh, Eli Drake or a uh, Bobby Roode. You know, he doesn't do one thing exceptionally well, but he's just really good at doing everything at a, at a very set level. He can work. He can cut promos. He's charismatic. He's tall. He's a good looking guy. He can play face. He can play heel. And he has a very decent following with his vlog channel on YouTube. He's a 
what do they call it a utility player you can put him in any role and he will succeed at it no matter what you give him he just needs to be given that opportunity now triple h is very good at taking guys like that and making them main eventers so that's why i can definitely see ethan page making a jump to wwe at some point number two now this one should be no surprise really it's the most likely one on this list and now i'm talking about andrade el idolo the former andrade cian almas andrade after being released from wwe back in march of 2021 made his debut in june of that same year andrade unlike the other wwe guys who came in he made his debut to zero fanfare like like he got the most lukewarm reaction right next to christian when he debuted in aew and right from the jump this guy got off to on the wrong foot okay they initially made his manager vicky guerrero you know to be his translator and mouthpiece because his english is serviceable but not great they soon realized how bad of a pairing that was they brought in chavo guerrero you know people like chavo chavo is a very solid hand to have around chavo ended up taking some time off to shoot scenes for glow and tony khan hasn't called him back yet which i don't know it's a little weird to me but tony khan is a weird guy and now he's hanging around that one dude with the glasses i don't know his name anybody in the comment section knows, knows his name let me know then andrade linked up with matt hardy in the hardy family office which was a terrible faction by the way it made no sense then they kicked matt hardy out and he took over the faction and then they all just split up soon after anyway and now they kind of have him in a good spot you know they, they brought in roosh and dragon lee and he got his own mini faction everybody in aw is, is in a goddamn faction now so why not the, the 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 point i'm making here is that andrade has done nothing substantial you know he's lost all his major feuds you know against cody against darby allen he always comes up short in title matches you know the, the, the very few that he gets and his entire AEW run for the most part has been a huge disappointment which is a shame because the guy can easily be a main eventer and i just think that he'll be better off back in wwe where you know he really got that solid push from triple h at nxt until he went to the main roster and got you know shadowed by Vince mcmahon and as well his wife works there charlotte flair so why would he not want to go back so this one just seems like not a matter of if but when number three is the only female on this list and i think hikaru shida could possibly make the jump to wwe at some point hikaru shida was one of the ogs of aew you know she was she was there from the beginning she made her debut at double or nothing 2019 and for what it's worth she has been one of the strongest booked women of that division she would go on to beat Nala Rose for the AEW Women's Championship at Double or Nothing the following year, uh, 2020, which was a blessing and a curse. So Sheeta to this day is still the longest reigning AEW Women's Champion at 372 days. But a lot of that came from the fact that she was champion during the pandemic era. Uh, most of her reign just kind of came down to random matches on dynamite and aew dark and of course there was no crowd so she really got the short end of the stick on that one this is also when the aew women's division was still in its infancy so like the quality of opponents she had was not good you know anna j big swole tay conti abaddon and probably the worst aspect of her title run is that she would just disappear from, from TV for like weeks at a time. We wouldn't see her. 
we wouldn't hear from her. She might have like a, a, a promo package once in the blue moon, but she would she was just going. And she wasn't hurt or anything. It's that Tony Khan just couldn't find space for her on the show. Which is so disrespectful to your women's champion, one that held it down during one of your, you know, slump periods. That wasn't cool. Following a trend, uh, Sheeta would drop the title to Britt Baker at Double or Nothing the following year. And she'll come back for a feud or a match on, on Dynamite Once in the Blue Moon. But for the most part, she's just been me meandering on AEW Dark. What, is, what does all of this mean? Okay, where, where am I going with this? Basically, what I'm saying is, Hikaru Shida has hit her peak in AEW. There is nothing else for her to do. I don't ever see her winning the AEW Women's Belt again, especially with this, you know, massive influx of new female talent like Tony Storm and Athena. I just don't see her ever reaching those heights again. And we all know that Triple H has this soft spot for like Japanese female talent. If you look at his history of, of booking them in NXT, you know, Asuka, Io Shirai, Kyrie Sane, you got Mako Satomura as the UK champion, you know, that, that weird schoolgirl from NXT. I don't know her name, it's not in my mind at the moment. Again, somebody in the comments, let me know. The Carl Ushida has everything that Hunter would want from that kind of talent. She's a, she's a great wrestler. She's experienced. She has tons of baby face fire, a, you know, a great on-screen presence. And she's also a very gorgeous woman. Number four might surprise you. Uh, this is a guy that I think definitely has a lot of potential. Under Triple H, we can see a superstar in the making. And I'm talking about Brian Pillman Jr. Brian Pillman Jr. Uh, made a nice little name for himself on in the Indies. He made his debut. He made his debut in AEW at Double or Nothing 2019 in the Casino Battle Royal, which he didn't win. He was immediately put into a tag team with Griff Garrison and Julia Hart, who were now the Varsity Blondes, which was a little throwback to the tag team that his father, Brian Pillman Sr., had with Stone Cold and they were the Hollywood Blondes back in WCW. And other than that, Brian Pillman has done nothing in AEW. The Varsity Blondes are a jobber tag team who get, you know, almost no TV time outside of AEW Dark. Um, he's had a couple of one-offs. I don't want to say feuds, but like big, big matches against MJF and Christian where, you know, the, 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 the typical heel shtick, you know, your mom is a crackhead, your dad is dead. It's, just, it's low hanging fruit. To, to top it all off, <laughs> their manager, Julia Hart, got her own storyline <laughs> and left the Varsity Blondes in the dust, <laughs> which <laughs> I find completely ridiculous, by the way. It's very similar to, do you guys remember uh, Buddy Murphy and Wesley Blake when they were in NXT? And they had Alexa Bliss as their manager. It's like, yeah, you got these guys who are the tag team champions, but all your but like the manager, you know, the short, cute blind manager ends up getting getting the, the, the push. Now I think Tony Khan missed a great opportunity to capitalize off that dark side of the ring episode about Brian Pillman Sr. You know, where we learned a lot about how rough Brian Pillman Jr.'s childhood was all the bullshit he had to go through with his mom and you know the men she was dating and it's like people are on this guy's side okay people like brian pillman jr but for some reason tony khan just doesn't see him more as a jobber at the moment which is a complete shame now triple h does have a way of unlocking you know this hidden superstar in a lot of people you can have the next breakout baby face in brian pillman jr or, hey, you, you never know. He might have that inner heel hidden inside of him like, like his dad. But we'll never know as long as he's just withering away in AEW. Now, number five is going to be the most shocking to, to a lot of you. And I'm actually going to cheat here and include a tag team as the number five. And I am talking about the Lucha Bros. 
Pentagon and Raytheon. Now, of course, these two guys are legends in the, the, the Mexico wrestling scene. They are very well known in the States, They're very popular. And they actually just might be the two most popular luchadors in the world at the moment. They made their debut at AEW, Double Nothing 2019. They, they are one of the OGs of AEW. You know, they were there since the beginning and they were a great pickup for this company who really needed like top talent to establish themselves as a true player in the wrestling industry. Now, for as popular as they are, I think their run so far has been mediocre. They just have been kind of like meandering and just tag matches and singles matches here and there. They got this little mini faction with Pac called the Death Triangle, which never made any sense to me. It's like you got these two luchadors and like this British guy. I, I don't get it, but I mean, sure, they, they work very well together. Now, eventually, uh, Penta and Phoenix would catch a break at All Out 2021 when they beat the Young Bucks in an insane cage match. I watched that live. Great match. And they won the tag belts. I wouldn't get hyped hearing that just yet. Now, in my opinion, this has to be the worst tag team title run in AEW history. They held the belts for five months, all right? From September of 2021 to January of 2022, okay? They had five title defenses. Three of those defenses happened on Rampage. Rampage. Nobody watches Rampage. That right there was a complete waste. They had one title defense on pay-per-view where they beat FTR. And their last title defense came on Dynamite, where they got beat by Jurassic Express. What a complete and utter farce this tag team title run ended up being. Especially when you compare it to the incredible run the Young Bucks had before dropping the belts to them. And even Jurassic Express had a you know a pretty good run. You know, they had all those triple threat tag team matches, but they were good matches. Like, the Lucha Bros just felt like an afterthought. And that is ridiculous considering, you know, the, the talent that these guys carry. Now, Vince McMahon has spent years chasing away every luchador not named Rey Mysterio. Ultimo Dragon, Sin Cara, Kalisto, Grand Metallic, the list goes on. I think the Lucha Bros can fill that gap that Rey Mysterio will eventually leave open. And they can also help attract that Latino demographic that they have been chasing for years now. But they can never attract because Vince buries all the foreign talent who can't speak English. So under Triple H, the Lucha Bros can become megastars. All right, and that's not an opinion, that's a fact. On their own as singles guys, they're great. As a tag team, they're great. Ray Phoenix is one of the most agile and insanely athletic wrestlers that you'll ever see. Pentagon is his own brand of psychotic, uh, badass wrestler. Now, knowing WWE's marketing tactics and their strategies, they could make a killing selling those masks. And it can make the Lucha Bros a lot of money. Those are five, but really six, AEW talents that I can see jumping ship from AEW to WWE on the realistic spectrum. So let me know if you guys think there's anybody else who can make the jump. Did I miss anybody? Am I speaking out of my ass? Y'all let me know.